Hey, how's it going? So, I must, uh, you did. You're lucky I wasn't able to get any grading done over your break, so I haven't graded them all yet. Um, if you can uh, arrange with Tom's to, to take it tomorrow, then I think that would be yeah. Um, so, yeah, no, no worries. Um, Derek, Derek missed the midterm, and so, so did Claire. Um, he said he'd be able to take it tomorrow if you can set him up um, someplace to take it. And I haven't talked to Claire at all yet. Um, I don't see her here today, so I guess we'll take that one, play that one by ear, see what happens with that. Um, but, uh, yeah, if that works. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. No All right, everybody. Who's excited to get their midterms back? I'm not quite done yet, though. So Wednesday, I'm, ha I'm about halfway done. I grade them one problem at a time, time to be as consistent as possible. So I don't grade like all of student A and then all of student B. So I, I finished, this morning I finished going through problem five, which was the conversions problem um, for everybody, which means the next the next half should go faster because they're shorter problems. There's less, there's less to them. There's only one part for most of the rest of the problems. So um, I should should have no trouble getting them back. If you watch your Canvas tomorrow, sometime um, I'll finish, sometime in the afternoon probably, I'll finish grading those and you'll be able to see your score and then I'll hand them back um, in when, on Wednesday. Um, overall though, so far everybody, you know, the, the average so far is about where I expect it. Um, I'm impressed every, Everybody listened and got those easy points for the most part. The class averages on the easy point problems like counting protons, neutrons, and electrons weren't perfect, but there were a lot of tens. Um, and this normally, this is the point where I start looking um, for you baseball fans about the end of problem five is about, about inning seven of a no hitter. That was when you start actually thinking maybe I'll have somebody that gets a perfect score this time. Um, nobody. Nobody's perfect through through three, um, let alone through five. So um, just too many little places to make mistakes. Simone? Right now, the median is about an 83. I did not grade anything new over there. That's probably that. That might. I'll check that. I just. All right. All right. Listen up, everybody. One last thing about the time pressure. I know that there's a little bit of time pressure on this test. It's built into it, and and that's one of the reasons why I stick to testing kind of the basic skills for the most part. Um. So. 
in the in the future, um, we can't. I can't really give extra time to people that are able to come in early because um, that wouldn't be fair if somebody else had had some circumstances where they're not able to make it here before 218 or whatever the beginning. Yeah, 218. Um, so, but just know I'm aware of the time pressure and now you know what I write, the way I write a test. And when you get your scores back, you'll see, I get lots of partial credit. Um, so just be aware that there's going to be some time pressure and look at it as, okay, factor that into, all right, this problem that I don't have any idea where to start. Don't sit and look at a blank piece of paper for five minutes when you can be, could be working on some other problems where, you know, you can get some points. Um, just try to leave yourself enough time to come back to it, or at least give it a, a, a shot in the future. But we'll, we'll do more details on, on uh, places where everybody can improve on scores and just in general how the class did um, once I have all the scores in and I can hand them all back and everybody can ask questions on Wednesday. Sound reasonable? All right. Uh, so let's start with just a bit of uh, stoichiometry practice to get ourselves back in chemistry frame of mind after a week off. Got potassium chloride added to barium nitrate and barium chloride precipitates. That's just like that, that lab from last week, um, from two weeks ago now where you got that solid, that was barium chloride as well, right? Hey guys. <laughs> So about about the lab, um, I I know that I don't I don't remember if I would adjusted the uh, the due date on Canvas for that or not. So don't stress about that. Um, get it get all the data that you needed and get it turned in tomorrow at the latest, and and you should be fine for that barium chloride lab. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can I can fix that while everybody works on. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna fix the submission link for for the exam review homework while everybody's working on this page real quick, or on this problem rather. So work with people around you. See if you can get an answer before I get back. All right. So another another note about grades. It looks like so Aries and Canvas don't always play nicely together when it comes to the grades and with midterms. Um, I was warned something weird might happen with the grades. Um, so the uh, 
everything from before the midterm looks like it's been it's been removed partially from from our canvas grade book um luckily i had been warned that that might be might happen so i have your grades backed up um as an excel sheet so but i need to figure out how to revert that so your grades on canvas look really really off right now um you know like half half of you have like 20 percent f's um that's i'm aware of it we'll take care of it no just it's like the first half of the assignments all disappeared and so now it's just the most recent assignments some of which you don't have grades for yet Why would you think that? Philip? Um, I'm going to be I'm going to start being a little bit more picky about that, but at this point, no. And for this problem, it doesn't really affect you what, what your product is, right? It doesn't affect any of the parts of this. Well, Gwen? No, I just, I just enabled that. It's all the defaults. When I make a new assignment, the default is to not allow any submission, and I have to remember to go in and change that. And sometimes when I'm in a hurry, I forget. In a hurry, I forget. So, all right. So, where do we start? We're trying to get get this reaction going. Balance, which that takes care of the two nitrates right there, right? So, Jay asked the question about why. How come it's not K2NO3 since there are two nitrates on that side? Because we define if it's potassium nitrate, our ratio of potassium to nitrate is defined by what? The charges, right? What do we need the charges to do? Add up to zero, right? So we can't just have two nitrates to one potassium. We, that's why we have to balance the reaction instead. So we start by writing it out and then balancing. We know we're gonna we have to make at least two of these, right? Because we have two nitrates here, so we need two nitrates over there. Which means we need two for the potassiums to add up to the same number on each side, which takes care of the chlorides for us as well, right? So I think that's all we needed. So once you have it written out, this would be a good time to keep it, keep yourself kind of organized, right? So it says 25 mils of 1.20 molar KCl. So I'll write that out, 25 mils, 25.0 mils at 1.20 molar and 15.0 mls at 0.9. Molar. If we want to know what's going to run out first, what should we do? Put it in liters and then into moles, right? And you can skip the liters step if you want, but it's still good good habit to write them out. Twenty five point zero milliliters every thousand milliliters is 1.20 moles of KCl. Is everybody okay with the way that I combine the milliliters to liters conversion and the mol and the liters to moles conversion into one? I'll write it out the long way for on the next one so you can see if that doesn't make sense to you yet. And that's it. If you write it like this, just one step.
15 for the other reactant, 15 milliliters for every 10 to the three milliliters. It's one liter for every one liter of the second solution. That's 0 0.900 moles barium chloride. One thing I will say about the first, first five questions on the test, um, a number of you on the conversions part um, didn't do your reasonableness checks when you're writing out your conversions and wrote things like there's a thousand liters in one milliliter um, or there's a thousand kilometers in one mile or a thousand kilometers in one meter, right? So we always wanna double check that, especially if we're going quickly with our conversions here. A thousand milliliters in one liter, that one makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, if the top doesn't equal the bottom, make sure you didn't multiply by a thousand where you were supposed to divide. Let's see. Point zero. Zero two eight. Eight ish. What do we get for this first one? Zero three even. We want to keep three sig figs. Then for the barium chloride, point zero one five times point nine. Hmm. So is it point zero? One three five. Ninety percent of fifteen is thirteen and a half divided by a thousand. So what's going to run out first? These are pretty friendly ratios, right? Two to one, something you can probably do in your head. We need twice as much potassium chloride compared to the barium nitrate. We have more than twice as much. So we should have some extra here. But if we want to show our work, we want to find out the theoretical yield. We can just start by calculating the theoretical yield for each of these in terms of grams. And then whichever number is lower has got to be the right number, right? Go back to your food analogy. If you've got enough cheese to make 12 pizzas and you have enough dough to make 20 pizzas, you can make 12 pizzas. So zero point, that's not gonna show up very well. Point zero three zero zero moles KCL and the two to one ratio. For every two moles KCL, that's one mole product. Keep all your sig fix that you can. Moles of barium chloride. We want to do this all in one step. It might be might make more sense rather than hitting enter on the calculator there to use the molecular weight of the barium chloride. And the second one, we're going to set it up just the same way, 0 0.0135 moles barium nitrate. And for every one mole barium nitrate, one mole barium chloride.
All right, who's who's uh, plugged in the numbers and got the molar, the molar weight for barium chloride? 208.2, thank you. Let's see, times 2.1015 times 200, be about, get about three grams ish. 2.81. Thank you, Jacob. Is that for the bottom one? Which, if that runs out first, that is also our theoretical yield. But if we want to look at them so we can compare them and convince ourselves. So we have enough potassium chloride to make 3.12 grams of product, but we only have enough barium nitrate to make 2.81 grams of product. So we can't just add these together, right? Enough cheese for 12 pizzas and enough dough for 20 pizzas doesn't mean 32 pizzas, right? We're not adding these together. Whatever the smaller number is, that tells you both what's running out first and what your theoretical yield is. All right, questions so far? It's all review, right? All feel pretty comfortable, hopefully. What about percent yield? Last step, right? Percent yield is what you get divided by what you could get. So actual over theoretical times 100. So our actual is given to us 2.45 grams. Our theoretical, 2.81 grams. Gets, was that around 80%? 87. Sick big question. Do sig figs apply to percentages? Absolutely. You can always get, if you can get more accurate by carrying more digits, that means it's a measured number, right? Which means percentages are measured numbers unless you're dealing with even fractions. If we said one out of five students, that's 20%, right? But if it's actually counted one out, if there's five students and I counted one of them answered yes, that's not about one, one for every five. In that case, that's an exact percentage. It comes from, it depends on what your measured numbers are, right? So if your measured numbers are exact, then your percentage can be exact. In this case, our measured numbers are both measured or are, did I say if your measured numbers are exact? That would be silly, wouldn't it? Um, if the numbers that you're plugging into your percentage are exact, then your percentage can be exact. If your numbers plug, that you're plugging into your percentage are measured, then your percentage is measured. All right, back in chemistry mode now. We've got a couple, a couple of topics today. Gonna going to look a little bit at um see if I've left much in the way of precipitation stuff in here. Um we're gonna add on to precipitation reactions a little bit and then we're gonna talk about pH. 
Um, and then that's going to be most of what we're going to do in terms of, of um, solution chemistry. That's the only new topics for solution chemistry for a while. Then we're going to start talking about gases on Friday, um, do gas laws. Um, did you guys use PV equals NRT in your other chemistry classes? Okay. So we'll go through all the basic gas laws, the simple gas laws, and then we'll derive PV equals NRT um, in our next class. And we can go pretty quick with that. And we'll start doing um, some, some problem solving with gases. Um, my favorite way to use gas laws when I'm writing tests for this class is to just make it one more way we can get to moles from measured numbers to do problems just like this. We make gas as a product, we can calculate how many liters of gas at one atmosphere, right? So it's still, it's gonna tie into stoichiometry. It's just not as simple as doing one conversion. Um, but that's all preview. That's what we're gonna get into on the next lecture. Um, the one topic I wanna talk about with these precipitation reactions and uh, solubility rules, is the fact that when, and we've, I've alluded to this a few times in this class, where we talk about when we have an ionic compound dissolved in water, do we still have it all present as one molecule once it's dissolved in water? We have it in a certain ratio where there's still one to one, but if this is gonna dissolve in water, think about what that what that looks like in terms of a, a crystal structure where say we've got alternating potassiums and so all the potassiums are the green ones and chlorides are the red ones. You've got this three-dimensional lattice that kind of goes infinitely in all directions where you've got these positives all lined up next to the negatives. So everything's really, really tightly attached to each other because you're you're alternating positive charges in green and negative charges in uh, in red. Well, what has to happen if we actually want to dissolve this? We don't actually have just one potassium ion and one chloride ion next to each other, do we? We've got this almost infinite array of these. So if we're going to get this to dissolve in water, Things don't actually stay, ionic compounds, when you dissolve them in water, don't stay as this crystal structure. Otherwise, they wouldn't dissolve. So what you actually have happening when something like this, when an ionic compound dissolves in water, it dissolves. How come some of them are soluble and some of them are not soluble? Has anybody thought about why that is? I know you guys got some practice using those solubility rules. And you'd seen those before. Why is it some stuff dissolves and some stuff doesn't? How tight the bonds are between these. If we said, if we take these plus one charges and replace them with plus two charges, now all of a sudden this doesn't stay dissolved anymore, right? If you make the attractive force between the ions big enough, then it doesn't stay dissolved. So working backwards from that logic, if, it, if we want it to be dissolved, we have to break these things apart. And basically we're gonna surround every one of these ions is gonna be surrounded with water molecules. So when we actually have an ionic compound that dissolves in water, we don't have an ionic compound dissolved in water. We have a bunch of ions floating around dissolved in water. And they all kind of fit into this sort of roughly octahedral molecular geometry where you have like these partial bonds. Where so if you had a potassium ion, that potassium ion is going to be surrounded by water molecules that all kind of line up so that the partial negative from the oxygens, I'm drawing them as though they're actual covalent bonds, but they're actually just ionic attracted because you have a partial negative on these oxygens, right? Because oxygen's more electronegative than hydrogen. 
So all of the partial negatives are going to wind up lining up around the, the positive charge. So we're kind of replacing that, that crystal structure that we had before. We had kind of like a plus one charge and a minus one charge. Those are attracted to each other, but a plus one charge surrounded by six partial negatives might actually be more favorable than having one plus one charge to minus one charge because it can be have a partial covalent bond or partial attraction anyway with a whole bunch of water molecules. Right, so when we have these aqueous ionic solutions, this is this is sort of the simplified way of looking at it when it comes to balancing things. But we actually have a much more complicated looking reaction. Um, if you actually take all of those aqueous solutions and split them up into their component pieces, into their ions. This is actually, a, this total ionic equation is what you actually wind up having floating around at any given time. If you mix lead, nitrate, and potassium iodide solutions, you really have lead ions floating around with nitrate ions, floating around with potassium ions, floating around with iodide ions. And so this is, this is what's called the total ionic equation, right? So the molecular equation is what we've been used to for these, these precipitation reactions. The total ionic equation is a better idea of what's actually happening. And that one is, no, there it is, right? Never mind. The arrow was just off, not centered in the uh, total ionic equation. So you have all of your pieces separately floating around. And then you make a product if you happen to have enough attractive force that you can overcome all of these favorable interactions between your ions and the water molecules. All right, so is this familiar? Okay. A little bit? Philip? Okay. So to get to the net ionic equation, so for the total ionic equation, we want to write everything that's floating around that's part of your, your system. Um, and so we could actually include plus water in there as well, although the fact that we wrote aqueous kind of implies that, right? That the water is also there. The net ionic equation means we're basically going to ignore any ions that don't react. If it doesn't form a precipitate, if it's not part of the precipitate, part of the reaction, we more or less just ignore it. So in the way you can see that is anything that shows up both as a reactant and then shows up unchanged as a product didn't do anything. So I'm going to be careful how I phrase this. Once you get a balanced reaction, you basically can treat it like a algebra equation. If it's balanced, anything you do to the to one side, you do to the other side. You treat you treat the reaction arrow like an equal sign. And basically all we're going to do to get to the net ionic equation is you just subtract it off everything that doesn't react from both sides. Right? So you started with two potassium ions and you ended with two potassium ions still floating around. Therefore, they just cancel each other out. We can subtract two potassium ions from both sides and it's still balanced, right? And we do the same thing with the nitrates. So our net ionic equation means you put, you're, you're down to just what's changing. You basically get rid of everything that's not changing. And this is this is why sometimes you'll see reactions written where you have things just floating around with no charges or where there's an overall net charge on both sides of the reaction. Like for instance, if we had HCO3 
with a minus one charge, which plus, I'll say sul sulfate. And these react in an acid-base reaction. The hydrogen carbonate acts as an acid. The sulfate acts as a base. What are the products going to be? If I'm, I'm telling you it's an acid-base reaction. What are the products going to be? Sometimes water is a product of, of an acid-base reaction, not always. In this case, acid-base reaction needs something that has a hydrogen to give and something that can accept the hydrogen. So we get, we make HSO4 minus one and carbonate. So we're gonna talk more in depth about acid-base reactions in a few minutes, but I'm just, I'm writing it out like this just to show you this is one example of, neither of these is a, is a complete compound the way it's written, right? Fit for it to be a complete ionic compound, we would need it to be written where the charges balance out and add up to zero, right? We would need some positive charges in here. Like I could say potassium sulfate and so and sodium hydrogen carbonate. And then we could write it out more completely. But this is the net ionic equation where we basically said, well, the sodium ions aren't going to do anything. The potassium ions aren't going to do anything. They're just going to, be, going to be floating around afterwards, just like they were before. In which case, why bother writing them, right? If the point I'm trying to make by writing out this acid-base reaction is that hydrogen carbonate acts as an acid and sulfate acts as a base, I don't care what the positive charges are, do I? Right, and so this is just, these three ways of writing these, um, these reactions out, we'll use different versions, different formats, depending on what we're trying to, what we're trying to do. If I want to know how many grams of sodium carbonate I need to add, now all of a sudden I do need sodium involved, right? Because I need to get a molecular weight of the solid. But if I'm just showing what happens once it's in solution, I could go to the net ionic equation. All right. Um, we're going to skip doing practice with precipitation reactions and solubility. I guess this is a good review for the for nomenclature as well. All right, so write out this these reactions. Start by writing out the molecular reaction for all four of these. And then once everybody has those written out, um, I'll pull up the solubility rules and we can practice using the solubility rules and then writing out the whole, um, the whole process. You could, you're going to want to see the solid you know what's more solid, what's the ions. So start by just doing the molecular, and then for practice, we'll do a couple of them. But the total ionic equations take a lot of writing. So probably just do a few of them. What's that state? You're supposed to tell me that. I'm trying to remember. It's been a bit, huh? I did. See, you can tell me that I'm on the Thank you. 
So to go back to the question earlier about am I going to be picky when it comes to writing out phases? If it's a precipitation reaction, I'm absolutely going to be picky about writing out phases, right? Because that's the only way that you can show me that a reaction actually happened is by showing me that something turned out to be a solid, right? So potassium carbonate, lead nitrate. Rem good, uh, good way to refresh your memory on charges on everything, right? I'm going to do the first two up here and leave room to do the total ionic. It's lithium sulfate, so Li2SO4, aqueous plus lead to acetate. Um, because the problem says predict whether an insoluble product will be formed in each of the following reaction combinations. So because you know that we're looking at precipitation reactions. So, so it's aqueous. If we're talking about precipitation reactions and solubility rules, everything on the reactant side is gonna be aqueous. So for this first one, what are our products, if any? Well, group 1A, soluble no matter what, except lithium phosphate. So we know that potassium nitrate is not going to be form a solid product. Carbonates are generally insoluble. So if you put lead to ions with carbonate ions, they make a solid. And what's the ratio? What's the formula for the product that we make as a solid? One to one, plus two charge on the lead, plus or minus two charge on the carbonate. And then if we're writing it out as our molecular formula, we have to show what the other product is, even though it's still aqueous. Potassium nitrate. That's just because like that other compounds that exactly. Once you put them, once you dissolve ionic compounds in water, if they dissolve, they pretty much all split into their component ions and are just floating around. <laughs> hold that. Hold that thought. Question is, does the order matter? The answer is absolutely not. As long as it's on the right side of the reaction arrow, we treat these plus signs just like just like in an algebra equation. And is that the commutative property where A plus B is the same as B plus A? So it does not matter how you write these. And so if you wanted to write the possible combinations before you even look at your solubility rules, that's totally fine. So we'll try that on the next one. The other thing I want to I want to point out is that we started talking about how when we dissolve ionic compounds in water, we split up all the ions, right? 
So it kind of makes sense that most of our insoluble compounds are what you get when you wind up with larger charges being paired up, right? A plus two and a minus two is going to have much more attractive force than a plus one and a minus one. And it's not even additive, it's it's mul multiplicative. Multiplicative? Yeah, multiplicative. Where if you double the charge on your, on your anion and you double the charge on the cation, the attractive force is four times as great. So you can have a plus one and a minus two still be soluble. You can have a plus two and a minus one still be soluble, but you put a plus two and, with a minus two, almost always you're gonna make something that's, that forms a solid, right? Because there's a lot stronger attraction between these two than there are between what we started with. There are more factors that go into it than just that, but that's a pretty good way of, of estimating without having to memorize your solubility rules. Yeah, and that's why you'll, you'll notice that phosphates, phosphates are up here with very few exceptions because a phosphate's a minus three charge, right? Minus three charges are really strongly attracted to everything else. So for the second one, let's switch up the order. Instead of starting by looking at our solubility rules, if it's going to be a precipitation reaction, we know it's got to be sulfate paired up with the lead, right? So we can just write, a, write out the other combinations in whichever order we want. And just don't write the phases yet. And then we're going to come back and look at our solubility rules to see if anything forms a solid. Just by looking at the charges, which one of these is more likely to form a solid? Yeah, in general, lead tends to be one of the one of the most common um, ions that form solids. So let's check our sulfates. Sulfates are soluble except silver, lead, barium, silver, lead two specifically. Barium, strontium, and calcium. So there's our solid. Yeah. Insoluble means when they pair up and they don't stay dissolved anymore, right? Soluble means that the water is able to hold the ions apart and it stays dissolved. If you if you make a combination of ions where the attractive force outweighs how, how stable the water can make the ions, then they stick together and you make a solid. So insoluble means it's more stable as the solid than dissolved with the water molecules. Just a whole bunch of different ways of saying the same thing. And then just because it's, it's technically possible that you could have two precipitation reactions happening at the same time if you very carefully picked your, um, your reactants, we should still check this one. But remember, column one on the periodic table, pretty much always soluble. The only exception is lithium phosphate. This is not lithium phosphate. And acetates are pretty much always water soluble as well. Except with, Except with yeah, with silver. Silver is a bit of, of an exception because it's, despite only having a plus one charge, it's still silver ions still tend to form solids more often than not, um, just because of the, the differences in size and how the, the d orbitals interact with the water molecules. Um, but don't, don't get too hung up on the exceptions. All right, so really quickly without, I'm not gonna write everything out for C and D. Do we make a solid for C? Yeah. Copper to okay. nitrate's no exceptions. If you see nitrate, you know the nitrate's not gonna make a solid. So that tells us that if we're gonna make a product, a solid product for C, it's gonna be copper with a sulfide. 
sulfides are generally insoluble. And so copper copper two sulfide, it would be our product for C. And then how about strontium and iodide? Strontium is not one of our, our exceptions for iodides are usually soluble. Strontium is not an exception. So for D, what do we write? So we, we could still double check potassium nitrate, but nitrates are soluble, no exceptions as well. So for D, there's no reaction. If you took a strontium nitrate solution and a potassium iodide solution and you poured them together, congratulations, now you have all four ions floating around in the same container. It, there are ways you can separate them. Um, it gets a little bit tricky, but it's mainly just on like the practicality point. From a, from a theoretical standpoint, it's not that hard. Practically trying to separate them, you can do things to change how soluble they are and get one of them to precipitate out first. What's the what would be the purpose of that? Oh, just to see if anything happens. If we we have our solubility rules, that's already been done for us. We don't need to just randomly mix stuff to see if stuff happens because we have our solubility rules. Somebody else did it. Pretty much. And there, there are, you know, our list of polyatomic ions is not complete, right? And our solubility rules as well. Um, you know, we didn't say anything about bromates or iodates. Um, they're going to have their own solubility rules that are slightly different than this. Um, and, you know, thiocyanates are going to have their own solubility rules. They're not on here. These are just the most common, the usual suspects, if you will. Um, why is it always U3, right? It's These are the most common ones. <laughs> I could be, but no. Um, all right, so we're going to write these out as we don't need our solubility rules anymore. We're looking at writing these out. Well, first off, if you write it out as the molecular, if you're trying to see if a reaction will happen, then you probably want to write it out as the molecular form to start with. Just because this allows you to get the right numbers in front of everything, make sure your charges cancel out properly and balance the reaction. It's, it's a lot um, harder to balance the reaction when it's in its ionic form, right? Because you don't have them all paired up the same way. I think though, all we need to do to balance this first one is a two there. So if we want to write this first one out as it, we'll do the total ionic equation, which is a big pain, especially since you have to show the aqueous on every one. You just take the pieces apart, two potassium ions, aqueous, plus carbonate ions, aqueous. And you also need to put your charges to get it 100% correct plus lead up, two ions, aqueous, plus two nitrates, minus one, aqueous. You see why this would be a pain, right? Do the total ionic equation. Very quickly, when you start getting comfortable with this, we'll skip the total ionic equation. And if you can write this, you you'll be able to go straight to the net ionic equation, because that's what the interesting part is anyway. And then we're gonna make the lead carbonate, PbCO3, as a solid. See, now that it's a solid, I don't split up the ions. Because it's a solid, they're not separate anymore. So if they're not separate anymore, we need to write them as one complete compound. Then we still have two potassiums floating around and two nitrates. So if you can get here, is it tricky to get to the net ionic? No, anything that shows up in the same form if on both sides, 
can just be canceled out. You have to have the potassium ions in there in the beginning because you needed to have them in order to make the solution in the first place. So the potassium ions are there, but because they don't, they're not doing anything for the net ionic equation, we would just leave them out. And our net ionic equation would just be lead to aqueous plus carbonate aqueous. goes to lead carbonate. Now, the reason that it's worth knowing how this works is because like, this, is, this is the easiest way when it comes to writing out your reaction the first time you're seeing these. But this isn't how things actually behave. And so when we start getting into figuring out and predicting how soluble something is, because remember, solubility is not really just a binary option, right? It's not soluble or insoluble, although that's how we've been thinking about it. Everything is slightly soluble. It just might be very, very, very slightly soluble. It might have, you know, less than... Um, you know, 10 to the minus 10 moles per liter is its saturation point. But in order to figure this out and understand how that math works, we have to understand, treat them like separate ions once we get to that point. All right, questions on this stuff. We ready to move on to more interesting reactions? Precipitation reactions are kind of fun, but at the same time, there's not a whole lot to them once you get the hang of it. They're fun to watch, exactly. All right, so let's talk about acid and base reactions. Acids sound dangerous, right? That sounds like it'd be more fun than, than precipitation reactions. So, Earlier, when I asked if I when I said, "Oh, this is an acid base reaction. What are the products?" and everybody said, uh, "Water." Why? Why is that? Why did you initially jump to water is definitely going to be a product if it's an acid base reaction? Because that's what we've seen in the past, right? Yeah, but it it turns out we need a better definition for an acid base reaction to be able to see it. Um, and so it turns out there's actually, depending on how you how you define your frame of reference, there are three useful definitions of an acid. Um, this first one, an Arrhenius acid, is just anything that when you dissolve it in water, it increases the concentration of H pluses floating around, which. Okay, well, why would that happen? Well, if you take something like hydrochloric acid as a gas and then you dissolve it in water, or if you take hydrogen chloride gas and dissolve it in water to make hydrochloric acid, well, one of our definitions of what an acid was, was, was it's like an ionic compound where your cation is an H plus, right? You guys remember thinking about that when we first learned the nomenclature? Anytime you have a, an anion where the charge is balanced out all the way to zero with H's, that's how we knew to name it as an acid, right? That in, dissolved in water. So th this is why this first definition applies is it increases the concentration of H plus ions because just like we were talking about, if this is an ionic compound and we dissolve it in water, then we don't really have HCl floating around, right? We have hydrogen floating around and we have chlorides floating around separately. And so Arrhenius, um, Arrhenius was a really interesting guy, Swedish guy, uh, his first name is Svante, which is kind of a cool name. 
um, always sticks out to me anyway. Um, he's actually the very first person who predicted that the Industrial Revolution was going to cause global climate change. And he did it back in about 1860. Um, in about 1860, he started running the numbers with how much coal was being burned in, in Europe and in the United States. And he said, we're going to have measurable increase in greenhouse gases as a result of human activity all the way back in 1860. So he was kind of all, all over the place when it came. He was a very, very versatile chemist. Um, and so his, his definition was one of the first definitions where they actually said, okay, this is what we're going to define as an acid. Um, but then two guys, two chemists came up, up a decade or two later and said, well, now that we understand what's going on at the molecular level a little bit more, we're going to say that an, an acid is anything that can give up an H+. Plus. Um, and they use the term proton donor just because and we've, we've talked about that in this class, right? We, what is a hydrogen ion? If you have an H+, plus, it's just lost its only electron, right? So if we say a proton donor, we specifically are talking about H plus is moving on. It doesn't mean we're changing what elements we have. We're not talking about nuclear reactants. Um, and then the last one is not going to matter too much until you get into organic chemistry. Um, but Lewis acids are things that increase the concentration of H plus ions when you put them in water, but might not have any H pluses of their own which sounds contradictory. How do you increase your concentration of H plus in a solution without adding something that has H plus in it? That's a good guess because density could in theory change concentration, right? If you have less mass. Now it turns out this also ties back into the way ionic compounds dissolve. Um, if you do, if you have something like lead three chloride, aqueous, with those iron ions floating around, they're they're really attractive to those oxygens and water molecules, right? To the point where you can actually start making um, a structure where the bond between an oxygen and a hydrogen on a water molecule actually starts to break because the high the um, iron winds up stealing um, enough electron density that one of these hydrogens can basically be pulled off pretty easily. So you can wind up with extra H pluses floating around just by adding something just with a, that has a, a strong a metal ion with a strong charge, strong positive charge. So this way we kind of, one of the reasons why we need three different definitions, if we're going to make them all work together. It's a Lewis acid you kind of need the definition of a Lewis acid to understand how a solution can get more acidic despite not adding anything with any more H pluses. All right, so for the most part in this class, we're gonna to stick to the Bronsted-Lowry definition for now. Um, but we wanted to be able to see all three of these. And again, it doesn't like my reaction arrow character spot. Um, and this stuff. So HCl is a gas when you dissolve it in water, you get H pluses and chlorides. So this is again, this is another case of it HCl meets both of those first two definitions. Right? It increases the concentration of H pluses because the HCl gives up an H plus. So if we have all these definitions for an acid. We probably have similar something similar for bases, right? So what's the what's a Bronsted Lowry base? Something that accepts the proton. What's a Lewis base? Something that donates the electrons. What about an Arrhenius base? decreasing the amount of H plus ions, although we don't measure it that way. <clears throat> we measure it by, we say it's, if it's an Arrhenius base, it increases the concentration of hydroxide ions. Well, how are those two related? How, do you, how does 
decreasing H plus concentration increase hydroxide concentration. Are those really just opposites then, or is it two different things happening? Yeah, continue your thought. Yeah, if you have a whole bunch of H pluses floating around and have a whole bunch of hydroxides floating around, they'll spontaneously bond together to make water. So, but the thing is this reaction, this reaction happens pretty much 100% of the time, but it's not always exactly 100% of the time. In fact, I'm gonna rewrite this. It turns out if you have pure water, you don't actually have pure water. Turns out if you have two water molecules, you can actually have one water molecule act as an acid and one water molecule act as a, as a Bronsted-Lowry base. What do you get when you have, when you have two water molecules acting as Bronsted-Lowry acid, acids and bases? Where are you gonna wind up as the products? Hydroxide and H3O plus, also known as hydronium. So it turns out if you have pure water, this is actually happening constantly. So both the reaction can happen in both directions though, and it happens a lot more frequently and easily in the reverse direction. But it means that at any given time in pure water, you have some hydronium and some hydroxide floating around. And the thing is, because this reaction can happen both directions, when, you, when this happens, you wind up with these two being inversely proportional to each other. Their concentrations will be inversely proportional, which what does that mean in everyday language? When one goes up, the other goes down. When one goes up, the other goes down. So increasing your hydroxide concentration does decrease your H plus ions. So when Arrhenius was around, they didn't really understand that when you have H pluses in water, you don't really have H pluses, you really have hydronium instead. So a more modern definition of an Arrhenius acid would be something that increases your concentration of, of hydronium. But it turns out that this, this whole reaction has, has a mathematical component to it where we can just say, okay, well, for water at room temperature, there's some constant. It's about one times 10 to the minus 14. And that your concentration of hydroxide times your concentration of hydronium will always equal that same constant. So, and this is what proves that they're inversely proportional. When, if they have to multiply together to get you the same constant, if this decreases, this has to increase to make sure that they still multiply together to get the same number. All right, and so we're not gonna do a ton with, with equilibrium mathematically yet, um, but I'm setting us up for how we can talk about how acidic a solution is. Does anybody know how we how we um, measure acidity in solutions? A pH scale. Does anybody know what pH is? Something with hydrogen's got an H in it, right? The P it turns out P is what mathematically we call an operator which just means it's a function. It's just a specific function. So P of anything is just equal to negative log base 10 of that concentration in molarity. So if, as long as we know what your hydroxide concentration is or your hydronium concentration, we can take the negative log of it to get an idea of how acidic that solution is. 
pH specifically is log base negative log base 10 of hydronium concentration. But you can have pOH, right? pOH would just be the negative log base 10 of hydroxide concentration. Turns out we use this operator a fair bit um, in order to get really, really small numbers into manageable things you can wrap your head around by making an exponential scale. All right, so. So the pH scale needed to, we needed a way to be able to identify how acidic a solution was, and we needed to be able to cover a really, really wide range of possible concentrations. Because these are inversely proportional to each other, we could use that to some extent to figure out how big our range could possibly be. Um, but if we have pure water, pure water, pure water, and it's going through that reaction that I just erased, I should have wait, pulled off, held off just for a second. What can we say about these two concentrations if it's pure water and there's nothing else in there except for water? They should be about equal, right? Because in order to make the hydronium, you had to also make a hydroxide, right? So if we're making hydronium for every one hydronium we make, we also make a hydroxide. So if we make X moles of hydronium, we also have to make X moles of hydroxide. So in pure water, what's the concentration of hydronium? Well, we know it's gotta be X. We just need to know what X is, right? So plug it in and solve. I assume technically it should be moles per liter. But assuming that our hydroxide and our hydronium are in the same container, it winds up canceling out. So we just plug in X for both of these. X squared is 10 to the minus 14, which means X is... 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven. And if X is one times 10 to the minus seven, what's the pH of a solution where hydronium and hydroxide are the same? It's gonna be a pH of seven. So when you take the negative log of this concentration, negative log base 10, log base 10, of this just gives you negative seven, right? And then negative, negative seven. So the other thing we always know about a solution in water is we know, so we know if it's neutral, that's how we define neutral as being when you have the same amount of hydroxide and hydronium. And we can say that if it's neutral and it's in water, they have to be 10 to the minus seven, which means pH is seven. What's pOH? Also seven. Because pOH is just negative log base 10 of hydroxide concentration. If those are the same, we would wind up with The OH is also equal to seven. All right, one more piece here. What if instead of actually getting numbers here, what if we just took the negative log of both sides of this equation as it is? What is one times 10 to the minus 14 when you take the negative log of it? 14 
And then we had negative log base 10 of all of this together, right? Who knows their laws of logs? Taking it right now. If they're multiplied together inside the parentheses, you can separate them out, but you have to make them additive. Does that look familiar? What is that? pH, right? And this is pOH. So as long as we're in a water phase solution, pH plus pOH equals 14. Technically, that 14 changes a little bit depending on the temperature. That KW number that I've started this, that 10 to the minus 14 number, changes a little bit as the temperature changes. Um, and if you're not in a water-based solution, it changes entirely. If we did the same thing with ammonia instead of water, ammonia is auto, this is called the auto dissociation reaction. Ammonia's auto dissociation has a K value of 10 to the minus 30. So in an ammonia-based solution, we, would, we wouldn't be adding things up to equal 30, 14, they would add up to equal 30, right? So for now though, this is a pretty good way. As long as we have any one of these pieces, if we have either pH, if we have pH, we can get to the concentration of hydronium. If we have pOH, we can get concentration of hydroxide. If you have pH, you can get to pOH. So we actually have a way we can figure out concentration of all of these and how acidic the solution is if we have any one piece of it, right? We'll practice with that on Wednesday. Yeah. Turns out if you have eight plus ions floating around when Arrhenius first defined it, he didn't know that. He was just um, it is due, yeah. So turn it in, um, and the uh, the submit button should.